So I wanted to thank you, the organizers of the conference, for inviting me uh, to present today some of the work that we are doing in an area that we call Big Data for Social Good, which combines data uh, with machine learning, and it has a very strong social impact. The main motivation for us and the main data that we use is mobile data. So as you know, there are more mobile phones in the world than people today. Uh, the mobile phone penetration, according to the ITU, ranges be between 80% and 120%. And what is very interesting is that we love our phones and we spend more time with our phones than with any other person or thing in our lives. And of course, the phones are increasingly intelligent and increasingly connected. And for the purpose of this talk, the most interesting insight is the fact that this is a global phenomenon that happens both in developing economies and also in developed countries. And we are gonna be focusing on uh, developing economies. So the idea of using mobile phone data for um, analyzing human behavior uh, has actually been highlighted by MIT Technology Review as one of the emergent uh, breakthrough technologies in 2013. And the idea is to be able to leverage the digital footprints that the mobile phones leave behind to be able to analyze large-scale human behavior, what is called computational social sciences, be able to understand the mobility of a city or of a country, something that we haven't been able to do before. And in fact, if we look from a societal perspective, a few years ago, United Nations started becoming very interested in the power of big data to help them make better decisions uh, that have an impact you know, everywhere in the world. So uh, when they were preparing the new uh, goals, the post-2015 goals for development, they started thinking about how they could include big data. And actually last summer, they commissioned a panel of experts to elaborate a white paper report on how United Nations could use big data for development. And in the new goals that they launched recently, they have a very strong element of quantifying uh, each of the different uh, goals, both in terms of being able to measure whether they are being achieved or not, but also using data to help them achieve these goals. So within this context, we are trying to see how we can also use the data from the phones for development. And before I explain what we are doing, I thought I would uh, give you a quick summary of the type of data that we are using. Have you ever worked with uh, mobile phone data? Okay, not that many people, that's good. So this is how a, a mobile phone sees the world. So there is, the, uh, there is a network of antennas that give mobile phone coverage. And usually what you do is you have, you do a voronoi tessellation of the space in such a way that you have in the center of each of these cells an antenna and you assume that the region of each of these voronoi cells is the area of coverage of the antenna. This is a rough approximation to reality, but it's a, a fairly uh, good approximation. So the representation is usually at this level. So the spatial granularity is not very good. Um, and the temporal granularity is not very good either. But if you are able to have big data, if you are able to have large uh, scale longitudinal data, that's where you can actually start inferring inter interesting aspects of human behavior. So this is the most used type of data for this type of analysis. It's called CDRs, called detail records. And what happens is every time a phone is active, it makes or receives a phone call or it sends or receives an SMS, there is an entry that is being generated. So this is event-driven data. If the phone is not in use, there is no uh, data being, used, uh, being generated. Obviously, everything is uh, anonymized and encrypted and aggregated at the cell tower level, so you can Imagine these Voronoi cells as being sensors of the activity that is happening in that area. Depending on the density of cell towers, the size of the Voronoi cell can be between a few hundred meters by a few hundred meters to a few kilometers by a few kilometers. So it's not very precise spatially, but it's definitely better than nothing, which is what most uh, institutions have access to today. From this data, you can usually compute variables of three types, consumption variables, so levels of intensity and the number of phone calls that are happening in each cell tower. Some social network variables, because you have the encrypted originating and destination number, so you can build a social graph and then compute some characteristics of that graph. 
And then some mobility variables as you look at uh, how the mobile phones are moving, only obviously if they are being used. So I'm just gonna illustrate, uh, show you a couple of videos of how this data looks like. The first video shows the levels of activity in the cell tower antennas in uh, a state of Mexico right before, during, and after an earthquake takes place. And it gives you an idea of volumes or amount of people that are in the different uh, regions of space. So the, ep the epicenter of the earthquake will be here. And then you see the big surge in activity. So using this data and just using such a simple sensor as the number of phone calls that are being handled in each cell tower, we can help tremendously because if uh, the Red Cross needs to send help to the affected area, we can give an estimate of roughly how many people there were there and which ones were the areas that were more, more densely uh, occupied. If we look at the mobility uh, between cell towers, then we can start seeing mobility. This is an example in the UK. We can start seeing mobility uh, in the main roads and the main cities. And again, it's very coarse, but it's extremely valuable because the, the alternative is not having anything. So with this data in mind, what we started working on about seven years ago is how we could leverage this data for social good. And we identified four different areas where we could have an impact. The first one is to help urban planning because you can understand flows of mobility, you can understand uh, amounts of people in different parts, you can identify areas that maybe are underserved or areas that are uh, too highly populated. You have to take into account that um, the census, which is the gold standard for understanding um, society, I would say from a quantitative perspective, is typically only computed every 10 to 12 years because it's extremely expensive to compute. So being able to leverage this data to have more uh, sort of like timely information is very important. Which brings me to the second topic, which is official statistics. So there is right now a big uh, interest and a number of initiatives, both in Europe and everywhere actually in the world, in trying to use big data, not only mobile network data, but also social media data to help build more robust and more up-to-date uh, official statistics. The third area which, is, uh, which I will present a project on is on crisis management. As I showed the example in the video, there is a natural disaster, there is an earthquake, there is a flooding happening, there is a hurricane, and you need to send help, and you don't know how much help to send, and you don't know where to send the help. How can we actually use this data to help make better decisions? And finally, and I will present also another project, there is the area of public health. Um, as you probably have read, the World Health Organization has recognized that there will be a very severe pandemic happening that will probably get rid of a big percentage of us in the, in the, in the, in the near future or mid-term future. So being able to use this data to better understand how a pandemic, for example, is propagating is very important. So let's get started. Um, the four main use cases that we have done in the past years are here, and I will present three of them today, because I don't have time to present all of them. But at the end, I have a list of relevant publications if you want to know more about the projects. I'd rather present three use cases than just one use case in depth. So again, if you have questions, you can read the papers, or you can come to me later and I can help you. The first project that I will present is on understanding the impact of floodings in Mexico and is in the context of natural disasters, and this was a collaboration with United Nations Global Pulse, with the World Food Program, with the government of Mexico. So something very important for all these projects is that we are just a component of the bigger picture. So we are trying to have impact in the real world, which means we need to collaborate with the people that actually have access to the real world or that have access to taking actions to help in a certain area. So all the projects, um, or most of the projects are done in collaboration with other entities that have access to the ground truth data and the domain um, experts that know, you know what, what is the problem you know, that we're trying to deal with. And what we bring is machine learning and data analysis expertise to work with them on this. So I don't know if you've heard of United Nations Global Pulse, any of you? 
No? Okay, that's good. So United Nations Global Pulse is a team that was created a few years ago within United Nations. They report directly to Secretary General. Uh, their mandate is to explore how you can use big data and machine learning to help United Nations. And they um, have different projects, many of them using social media, but we also have been collaborating with them for the past few years to see how mobile data can also help. And this is an example of the project. This project is dealing about floodings that happened in the state of Tabasco in Mexico. It's one of the states where there is seasonal floodings, and many times these seasonal floodings become too intense, and they actually become a, 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 natural, a, a national emergency and a natural disaster. So the example that I'm going to present is from a flooding that took place between the 31st of October and the 3rd of November of 2009. There were over 200,000 people affected, and the government declared a state of emergency. And there were two main questions that we wanted to answer. The first one was, could we use the patterns of activity in the antennas as a sensor of which areas were being affected by the flood, floodings or not? Because if we can, then it's a very nice way to immediately know which ones are the areas that are being affected. And the second question that we wanted to understand was, the government, like, like always, um, took some measures to try to inform the population that there was a risk of floodings. And we wanted to see whether these measures actually had an impact or not. So let's look at the first question. The first step is to reconstruct, this was back in 2009, so we had to reconstruct everything that happened around these, these floodings. So we combined different types of data. Um, we used NASA Landsat data to understand where were the most affected areas in the floodings, and we had to take that as the ground truth. We also used census data to see if the mobile data and the activity in the cell towers was being representative of the population, because this is just a sensor, and if our sensor was biased, uh, then probably we wouldn't be able to get any meaningful results. So we had to have some kind of like warranty that if we use the activity in the cell towers as a proxy of what is going on in the area, that is actually representative of the area. And then we also use official data that the, the government shared with us to create a timeline of what was happening with the different actions that the government took and how aware the people were of the fact that there was a risk of floodings. In terms of the representativeness, we um, estimated the uh, number of people in different regions in the state, and we had official census data, and then we found that there was a very strong correlation between them, and that was uh, reassuring for us that if we use the activity in the cell towers, it would be a good proxy of uh, what was going on in that area in terms of the number of people. And then what we wanted to do was to see if by looking at the number of phone calls that each cell tower was handling, the number of unique phone calls, um, there were patterns in that signal that they were significantly changing when there was a flooding. And then that way we could use that as a way to determine which ones were the areas where the floodings were happening. So we use a very simple metric, which is sort of like a z-score metric. We built a baseline model from before the floodings, and then we use that to compare with the actual activity and see if we could detect when the floodings were taking. So this is the, the, this uh, metric, and then you can see there is big peaks during the floodings, and there is also big peaks during Christmas. So we also looked at the behavior during Christmas because we knew that this is a, a time when there is increased activity to corroborate that it was a good metric, and it was. So I'll show you a quick video of how the, this metric is changing over time. So here you have the, this is before the floodings. And there isn't really any kind of anomalous behavior. And now you start seeing a lot of anomalous behavior. These are the areas affected by the floodings. And then one of the differences is when during Christmas, there is a lot of anomalous behavior, but it's generalized everywhere in the state whereas in the floodings, it was concentrated around the area when the floodings were taking place. So in answering the first question, uh, we did find that we could use the patterns of behavior of the cell towers as a way to determine which areas were, affect were affected by the floodings. Um, and then we tried to answer the second question. So the green line here 
is the time when the civil protection of the state raised an emergency warning in the population. And the red line is the C score that we're calculating, and then the blue line is the amount of rain that happened. So something, something that we observe is that there was no really a not much of anomalous behavior when the civil warning came or immediately after. The real anomalous behavior happened too late because it happened when the floodings had already taken place. So one of the insights that we draw from this is that the civil warnings were pretty much ignored by the people. We didn't observe any, any different behavior there. And only when their house was flooded and there was kind of a disaster is when people started reacting um, to the floodings. So one of the insights that we shared with the government was uh, that they should probably reconsider their strategies for uh, warning citizens because it hadn't been very effective. And related to that, I'm going to present a second case study that we did during the H1N1 flu outbreak in Mexico in 2009, which you probably remember because it was the first H1N1 flu outbreak. Uh, and this is in the context of pandemics. So just to refresh your memories, and we're going to tra travel back to 2009, and I'll share with you the timeline of what happened, and then I'll explain to you what we did with this data. So as you might remember, in April of 2009, um, in Mexico, there were the first confirmed cases of H1N1 flu. And the, at the beginning, it didn't seem to be a very big deal, but um, there were three different stages that the Mexican government sort of like issued three different types of alerts to try to contain the progression of the disease and try to prevent the population about it. The first one, which we will call the first level of alert, which took place on April 17, was just a medical alert. It was not a government intervention. It was just a recommendation that the government issued saying that there were a few confirmed cases of, cases of H1N1 flu and that people should be careful. They should try to avoid going to very crowded places, but it was just a mere recommendation. A few days later, a week later actually, on April 24th, as the number of confirmed cases had been increasing, there was more and more pressure on the Mexican government to implement a little bit of a more aggressive action because there was a lot of concern that the flu might actually spread and become a pandemic. So they didn't issue a warning like in level one, they actually did an intervention. And the intervention consisted of closing schools, universities, museums, they, for example, they didn't cancel the soccer games, but people couldn't go to the stadiums. They just were the players playing there alone. So any big, you know, any conference like this, they would cancel any situation. Church services were canceled. Any situation where a lot of people go, they were canceled as a way to uh, try to avoid uh, people spreading the disease. However, the number of confirmed cases continued to increase. And I think it was on April 29th that the World Health Organization raised the uh, risk of pandemic to the maximum risk. And they said that the, the, fact, the uh, H1N1 flu pandemic was imminent. So there was a lot of pressure not only in Mexico, but everywhere in the world for the Mexican government to do something more radical. And they did. From May 1st to May 5th, they applied the third level of uh, alert, which was a very severe intervention where they shut down basically the country for five days, except for emergency services, hospitals, um, uh, firemen, and so forth. So it was a very costly um, intervention that was kind of like the last attempt to try to retain the disease. The reason why you apply these interventions is, is because an infectious disease, it only becomes a pandemic if people move. If people don't move, it doesn't spread. So if you have the flu and you stay home and you don't infect anyone, then the flu doesn't spread, right? So one of the key elements to contain a pandemic is to retain the mobility of the population. And if you are able to do that, you, have the, you, you sort of like restrain the, sp the geographic spread of the disease and then it doesn't spread. However, despite all these efforts, about a month later, the World Health Organization declared that there was a global H1N1 flu pandemic, which was the first pandemic of the 21st century. So after all of this, and you might remember, but there was some criticism to the Mexican government, maybe they should have done something else. So we tried to answer two questions using our data. 
The first question was, did these measures help? Did they actually have any impact at all on the mobility of the population? And the second question was, was there any impact on the progression of the disease because of these measures? And these are the two questions that we uh, try to answer by using, again, the type of data that I presented, the mobile network data. So what we did was we analyzed mobile data from January until May 2009, so it covered a larger period than the uh, flu period, and we computed the mobility of um, the different towers visited over that period of about a, a random sample of uh, a million anonymized mobile phones. It covered all the different stages, and then we used baselines because we had to compare the mobility during each of the stages with the normal mobility or the baseline mobility. So we use the same time periods, but for the year prior to that year, which is the best reference because you have to take into account a lot of seasonal effects. So you cannot compare May with August because August, you know, people are on vacation, it's a completely different. So you need to compare May with May the year before. So we looked at the impact on mobility uh, during each of the different three stages. And we found sort of like three uh, insights. The first one was that the first stage, which was just a recommendation, didn't have much of an effect. We didn't find a statistically significant reduction in mobility in the population. And this is also aligned with what we found with the floodings. So it seems that when the government issues a recommendation, we just don't listen to the recommendation, or we think that it doesn't affect us, it affects our neighbor. So uh, it didn't really have much of an impact on the population. So I think one of the insights is maybe these recommendations are kind of useless, or we need to find a different strategy for issuing recommendations. The interventions were effective. They did reduce the mobility. But the surprising insight was that we found an 80% reduction in the mobility. So 80% of the people significantly reduced the mobility during the second stage, but we only found that 55% reduced it during the third stage, which was much more severe. And one of the potential reasons for this is that this third level happened during a holiday period, because May 1st is a national holiday in Mexico, and May 5th, it's a national holiday in Mexico. And it is known that mobility is usually reduced during holiday periods because a lot of the mobility is due to commuting. And people, when they are on holidays, they might travel somewhere, but then they stay there. They don't really travel that much. So there was already reduced mobility because of the holiday period. So the impact was um, smaller than during normal weekdays, which is this, this um, uh, period here. So one of our insights was if you are going to issue an intervention, probably uh, uh, applying it during regular working days is more effective in reducing mobility than during um, uh, holidays. And then the second question was, okay, so they reduced the mobility a little bit, so the measures did work, but what was the impact on the progression of the disease? Was this reduction in mobility useful for anything or not? And of course, we can't play in the real world, apply scenario one and scenario two, and then compare. So we had to do simulations. Um, so what we did was we used a state-of-the-art, agent-based epidemiological model, and we generated two scenarios. One scenario with the baseline mobility, so the mobility if, as if nothing had happened, and a second scenario with the reduced mobility that we observe. And we ran both scenarios, of a disease propagation system, and then we compared. So the disease propagation system that we use has three main sort of like uh, types of variables or inputs. You have a mobility model, and we use the normal mobility, the baseline mobility for one scenario, and the reduced mobility for the other scenario. You have a contact model, and there we use the reciprocal phone calls as an approximation for the contact model. And then we use the disease model, and this is called the S, EIR model, which is one of the state-of-the-art epidemiological models, where the different agents go through different stages uh, as the disease propagates. So we introduced that in a disease simulation engine, and we generated two um, disease uh, propagation curves. This one, the yellow one, is the one when we use the mobility, if the baseline mobility, as if the government didn't do anything. This is the percentage of infected agents, and this is time. 
So as you see, this was the first cases, and then it starts spreading and spreading, and then you know, there's a point where it decreases because everyone has already been infected, uh, and there's no, more to, uh, um, no one else to infect. And this is the curve with the reduced mobility because of the intervention. So we can see that the peak number of infected agents is about 10% lower, and the peak of the um, uh, disease is about 40 hours later which might not seem like a lot, but when you are in a crisis situation, 40 hours, which is like almost two days, is a lot of time to mobilize doctors, to order medication, to allocate more beds. So it did seem that the measures were able to uh, slow down a little bit the progression of the pandemic. And now I'm gonna present the last project, which is a project on another topic, which is crime. And this project is a collaboration with uh, MIT and the, the University of Trento and the FBK, which is a research institute also in Trento. And this project was the result of a datathon for social good that Telefonica organized um, in September 2013, where they shared anonymized aggregated mobile data with researchers, whoever wanted to register, uh, as long as they did projects for social good. And the, the topics were completely open, but you had to have a positive social impact with the project. And there were a lot of projects that were presented, and this project was the winner. So from that point on, we started collaborating, and this is the result of the uh, collaboration uh, to do this project on crime. So as you probably know, uh, crime affects the quality of life of a region. And there has been a lot of studies trying to understand the relationships between crime and a number of variables, mainly socioeconomic variables, which are the variables that you can get from the census. So unemployment rates, and immigration rates, and ethnicity, education. And there has been recently a lot of studies that have found that crime tends to cluster geographically in an area, in what is called crime hotspots. So geographically, there isn't like a uniform distribution of crime. And I think you know from your own cities that are parts of the city that are safer and there are parts of the city that are less safe. So this is well known now also in, in criminology. When we look at the relationship between crime and the urban environment, there have been two main theories being proposed in the past 40 years. The first one, which is a picture of uh, this lady here, is Jane Jacobs' theory. And Jane Jacobs' theory wrote a book called Eyes on the Street, and she talks about the concept of natural surveillance. And what she says is that if you have an area that has a lot of diversity, that has a lot of movement, a lot of people going through, we all act as policemen to each other, and it's a safer area. Because if there is a lot of people there, somehow you feel safer. If I see that someone is mobbing you, I kind of like, I'm gonna defend you. So that was one theory. But then, a few years later, Newman came with the opposite theory, called the defensible uh, space theory. And what he was saying was that if you have an area that has a high mixture of people, that area is more anonymous because people don't know each other, and therefore it's less safe. And areas where people know each other, uh, where it's a community that they are neighbors and they all know each other, are safer, because people have a relationship with each other and they protect each other. So until now, we haven't been able to really determine who is right, if Jane Jacobs is right or if Newman is right, and of course, maybe both of them are right, or maybe both of them are wrong, because also there is a lot of cultural um, elements that play a role. So with this project, we tried to see uh, if we could shed some light on who was right and which variables matter in the context of crime. Another important concept to distinguish is a, a place-centric model of crime versus a people-centric model of crime, which would be like minority report. So a people-centric model of crime is trying to determine whether a particular individual is going to commit a crime in the future or not. Whereas a place-centric, what it's trying to determine is whether a certain area in space is gonna be the scene of crimes or not. This concept that I mentioned of crime hotspots. So in this project that we did, it's a place-centric uh, pro uh, project about crime. So we are not trying to determine if any individual is gonna be a criminal in the future, we are trying to determine if a certain region of space is gonna be a crime hotspot or not. And it's data driven, and we use different types of data, so it's a multimodal approach, including data that you can derive from the mobile network about people dynamics. It was for the European metropolis of London, the metropolitan area of London, and the task is to predict whether um, 
a certain neighborhood is going to be a crime hotspot or not. And this is the three different types of data that we used. We used the crime data, which was shared. So I, I forgot to mention that in the datathon, there was not only data shared from the mobile network infrastructure, there was, it was also in collaboration with the Open Data Institute, and, there, and therefore there was also data shared from the city of London. So there was census data, there was criminal cases data, there was uh, emergency health services data, a, a lot of open data. So in this project, we used two uh, sources of open data, the criminal cases data set, and then the London Borough Profiles data set, which is the census data. And then we also use the uh, human dynamics data. So I'll explain each of the data sets now. So the data that was shared wasn't exactly like the data that I mentioned in the other two projects. It was the data that was coming from a product that Telefonica has called Smart Steps. And what this product does is, instead of doing a Voronoid tessellation of space, they do a grid. And as you see, the size of the squares in the grid changes depending on the density of cell towers. So you have very small sizes when you have a lot of cell towers, and then very big sizes here, like in rural areas, when you have just like one cell tower. And um, the area of coverage of the cell tower is approximated by these um, squares in the grid. And then it gives you a number of numbers um, on an hourly basis of what is going on in that square. So it tells you an approximation of how many people there are, and the gender uh, ratio of the people, and the age ratio, and so forth. For this particular data phone, what we had watched for each cell and for each hour, we had an estimation of how many people were there. The percentage of these people that were at home, at work, or visiting. Gender splits, and then age splits. And this data, this demographic data, was coming from a market research company. Because this is what market research companies do. They try to uh, estimate a lot of the demographics in different uh, regions. The crime data was geolocated crime for two months. The, te the temporal granularity was just monthly, so we just had for one month and then the next month. Um, we defined the hotspots by taking the median number of crimes in the area and then saying if it was higher than the median, it was a hotspot, uh, otherwise it wasn't a hotspot. And then the spatial granularity, it wasn't the grid. It wasn't exactly the grid as the smallest grid. It, it was what is called LSOA, which you can see here, which are small geographic areas. This is typically defined by census offices. And they define them in a way that they have a mean population of, of 1,500. So it's, a, it's like, sort of like a zip code, but you know, uh, probably smaller than a zip code. Um, so we had the information for each of these, of these areas. And we had 68 metrics about the population plus the crime information for two months. So we did, first of all, the first thing you have to do is put the same representation on everything. So we made correspond these LSOA areas with the grids from Smart Steps. And then from the Smart Steps data, we computed a lot of features. We computed a lot of like first order features and second order features and different time windows because this is a spatial temporal data. So you have to play a lot with the different temporal windows that might make sense. Um, we ended up with about 6,000 features, so we applied a feature selection to reduce the dimensionality. And also, we wanted to have a model that would be of similar complexity as the model using the census data. And because the census data has 68 variables, so we uh, created a reduced subset of the uh, top features, the top 68 features. In terms of the modeling, it was just a binary classification, uh, whether an area is a hotspot or is not a hotspot. We tried different models, and the one that worked the best was a random forest, and this is the results that we got. So we compared uh, with a very basic baseline, and then we built a model only using the census data, only using the mobile data, and then the combination of both of them. And then we were able to go significantly up in accuracy or in F1 uh, uh, from the baseline or just using the census data. This is just some visualization, but it's difficult to see of like the ground truth versus the predictions. But what is probably more interesting, at least for the city of London, is understanding which variables are correlated with crime, which variables have some kind of like predictive power. So in terms of the temporal scale, we found that daily dynamic features were the most predictive when compared to other time scales. We had hourly, we have morning, evening, we have weekly, we have different uh, time scales. 
we also started finding features that were related to the theories of Jane Jacobs and, and Newman. So we found that the number of residents was a very important feature, and in fact we found that the higher the number of residents, the higher the crime, which would be uh, in contradiction to Newman's defensible space theory and sort of like supporting Jane Jacobs' theory. In addition, we found a lot of entropy-based features, as features that were important. And these entropy-based features can be somewhat be interpreted as the diversity features and the mixture features that Jane Jacobs was proposing. And we actually found, again, evidence of Jane Jacobs' theory. Like, the high entropy features, the more entropy there was in a feature, the less uh, crime there was. It was also very interesting to see in the joint model that out of the 68 features, only six features were coming from the census information. So all the other ones were related to dynamics, to people dynamics. So this is very interesting because the state of the art is using, actually is mainly using either socioeconomic features or crime, predicting crime from crime. And the most um, important features that we found were related actually to uh, immigrants and ethnicity groups and people that were unemployed and so forth. So I think one of the more important implications is this idea that using people dynamics you can actually help in understanding why an area is safer than another area. These are relevant publications and I have two minutes or three minutes left so maybe I'll just quickly highlight some of the challenges just as food for thought on this area. So this is an area that has a huge amount of potential. I've shown you some examples. I'm extremely passionate about it, but it has a lot of challenges, and I, and I want to share with you some of the challenges. You might have encountered already some of these challenges during the Ebola crisis. So there were a, a, a cookier who is a very well-known a journalist that has writes a lot about big data was very active reporting in The Economist about how big data was failing uh, to be used to help in the Ebola crisis that happened last year. And he wrote this um, very popular article on how you know, it had been impossible to be able to leverage this data even though it could have helped a lot epidemiologists to um, better understand how Ebola could be propagating. So why? Why is it so difficult? And I think there are a lot of reasons why. One of the reasons is internal. Um, in most companies that have this type of data, not only um, telco data or mobile network data, but also social media data, until now, there hasn't traditionally been a group called Big Data for Social Good, or a group whose um, top main topic is how to use this data to help the world. So there are some internal barriers in the companies because this is always done almost like a, f mm, sort of like a free time project of a very passionate individual in the company. And I think until we have a more established area you know, within the company saying, okay, we're gonna devote our effort in helping you know, in these areas, it's gonna be, there's always gonna be some kind of an internal barrier. Related to this, um, there is a risk-benefit analysis that needs to be done because even though the data is fully aggregated and fully anonymized, um, there are some unintended consequences that could happen depending on who has access to this data. And this became evident in Africa. So if you are a government that is not a democratic government and there is a certain ethnic group that you don't like, and you are able to see how this ethnic group is moving, you could potentially use this you know, for your own benefit. So uh, there is always this element of trying to understand you know, uh, what are the potential uh, risks. There are regulatory limitations, obviously, because a lot of this data wasn't designed to be used for computational social sciences and to help the world. So there is legislation and regulatory um, barriers and, and conversations that need to happen with regulators and, and legislators to really see you know, how uh, we could leverage this data in, in a respectful way. There are many technical, many technical challenges. Um, it, it is very difficult to actually use this data. As I mentioned um, earlier, you have to work with other entities that have the ground truth, that know what's going on, that know whether this is gonna be useful for them or not. There is a lot of issues on whether the data is representative, on how you combine data from different sources, on how you do this in real time, because none of this was done in real time. There is, um, there isn't really ground truth. You can really do real experiments in the world, so it's impossible almost to infer any kind of causal relationship between any of these variables. Um, there are many, many, many technical challenges. And then, of course, there is also some privacy and security challenges. 
um, it is critical to ensure that there is absolutely no risk to any privacy and, you know, as I mentioned before, to have a clear code of conduct and to have a very uh, well-known process to who is accessing this data and for what, because otherwise, you know, as I mentioned with uh, the example of a non-democratic, you know, government, it could be used for other purposes than the objective of the project. A, lo a lot of us working on this have proposed a framework for data sharing that we think can be helpful in pushing this area while uh, dealing with a lot of these challenges. And I think if any of you has access to data or is interested in this topic, I think a very important question that we need to all answer is how can we responsibly use this data to actually have real impact in the world? Thank you. Thank you.